I was part of a U.S. Air Force cover-up for 17 years. I was uh, officer in charge of photo optical instrumentation at Vandenberg Air Force Base from 1963 to 66. And during that time, I was in charge of a 100-man unit that was responsible for providing engineering sequential photography for every single launch from the, from the Western Test Range, which was at Vandenberg Air Force Base. Our duty was to provide um, coverage of every launch because back in those days, 1963, 64, um, many of the missiles blew up on the pad and the engineers at Boeing and Douglas and other outfits were building these, these missiles needed to know what was happening, uh, what took place frame by frame, second by second, in fact, millisecond by millisecond. We'd have uh, about 30 cameras set up on every single launch. We'd have three tracking sites to provide the triangulation for the things. And one day I got a call from my uh, major Florence J. Mansman, who was the optical instrumentation officer at First Strategic Air Base uh, Air Command. He called me into his office and said, Bob, have you ever been up to Big Sur? And I said, well, when I, in my college days, I was a beatnik, and I remembered uh, Lawrence Furlingetti uh, speaking his poems at the Lepenthe, Lepenthe Cafe in Big Sur. So, yeah, I've been up there. I said, well, I want you to go up there, and there's a forest uh, uh, service station on Anderson Peak. I want you to go up there and just take a look around and see if it's possible for us to get a line of sight from Big Sur back down to Vandenberg. I said, okay. And I hopped in my... Uh, station wagon and drove up to Big Sur. I met the Forest Service officer there and he took me up to the Forest Service Road, which you can see here. And we found a place where uh, a prearranged time a missile was launched and I managed to look down the, down the coast about 160 miles. And yes, we could see the thing from, from the side. The point was that the engineer wanted to see what was going on from the side view of these missiles. From our positions on Vandenberg, all we could do is look up the tailpipe. So we took a tracking, a tracking mount up there and photographed with our little uh, cameras uh, a couple of launches. And sure enough, the engineers were excited to see the, the uh, side view. Next thing that happened is after I had established this site, Major Mansman called me and said, I want you to go back up to the site. We're sending something up for you. So I drove back up to Vandenberg, uh, to a Big Sur, and suddenly um, this huge truck came pulling up the Forest Service Road. It was towing a, a massive telescope, a cadaveric telescope, with a potential focal length of 2,400 inches. So I'm sure you photographers in the crowd will know that uh, 25 millimeters for a 60 millimeter camera is, uh, or a one inch lens is normal. Imagine a 2,000 uh, uh, inch telescope. That's it that you're seeing on the screen right now. We set this telescope up and did a couple of tests with it, and then something magical happened, something that changed my view of the universe and our position in it. On September 14th, 1964, there was a launch of an Atlas D missile from Vandenberg, and this group that you see here in front, I'm the guy wearing the MG jacket. We were told to wear civilian clothes up there so we didn't get the natives riled up. Uh, there was an early morning fog bank as we looked down the coast toward Vandenberg. Suddenly this missile popped out and it flew down range beautifully against the, the, the clear sky. Now we couldn't see what the telescope was seeing. So I need to explain to you why we missed it on the site. So this telescope had a, an image orthokon tube which was attached to the telescope. So the signal went from the telescope into the image orthokon tube and a 35 millimeter Mitchell camera was established shooting the picture of the surface of the image orthokon tube. It was called kinescope recording. For those of you old enough to remember kinescope recording from uh, the old days of TV. So it was covered with a black shield and we couldn't see what, what was in there. Anyhow, we watched this missile go until it went out of our sight, but the 2000 inch telescope, which at that point had about a focal length of a thousand inches, locked down on it, we were radar tracking it, locked down on what was in, we couldn't see what was, what was in it, um, but we were all celebrating, jumping up and down, saying, yeah, we got it, the engineers are going to be so happy, and um, uh, the, the, the folks from 
uh, from BU who brought the telescope out to us were happy. And everything settled down. I went back to, to Vandenberg. Two days later, I was called by Major Mansman. He said, uh, Lieutenant Jacobs, uh, I want you to come to my office right away. Why? The major tells you to do something, and you're a lieutenant, you do it. So I hustled over to, st to First Strategic Air uh, Headquarters. I walked into Major Mansman's office, and I'll describe for you what I saw. There was a table set up in his office, and on the table was a 16 millimeter, millimeter projector. There was a daylight screen on the wall uh, uh, adjacent to it. There were two guys, two men in gray flannel suits. There was Major Mansman and his office over, over here, and here was the screen. Major Mansman said, Lieutenant, sit down. And I did, and he said, now watch this. He turned the projector on, and the most amazing thing happened. We could see the three, uh, uh, the bottom three stages of that rocket filling the frame from 160 miles away. It was amazing. Uh, the clarity was beautiful, and that thing took off, and we watched it go through all three stages of powered flight, stage one, stage two, stage three, and then we saw, incredibly, at a long, long distance. The thing was now heading for Kwajalein. And the nose cone opened up and radar chaff, essentially aluminum foil, spread out in front of it. Here's what, what the function of the aluminum foil was. We were testing uh, to see if we could launch a, a nuclear warhead into an orbit slightly above the nuclear chaff so that the Russians would aim their anti-missile missiles at the chaff and our little warhead will go spoop like this and fly over and obliterate Moscow. That's the game we were playing. It was horrifying to think about in, in retrospect. Anyhow, as the thing was flying along, we saw the, the warhead uh, eject in over the chaff and it was flying along. And we're going about 8,000 miles an hour now. And suddenly, from in the frame, we saw an object come in from the same way we, we were going, 8,000 miles. This object flew in. Um, I'm trying to do something here on the screen so you can see. The object flew in. It, it came up to our warhead. It went around the top of the warhead, fired a beam of light down onto the top of the warhead, went around to the front of the warhead. Man, we're all traveling at about 8,000 miles an hour here. Fired another beam of light, went down below the warhead, fired another beam of light, went around the way it had come in, fired another beam of light, and then flew out of the frame the same way it had come in. At that point, the warhead tumbled out of space. We were, we had, let me, let me tell you what happened next, just, just the same thing. The lights came on, Major Manson looked at me, the two guys in gray suits looked at me, and Major Manson said, were you guys screwing around up there? And I said, no, sir. He said, then what was that? And I said, it looks to me like we got a UFO. Major Manson said, you are never to say that again. As far as you're concerned, this didn't happen. He said, you understand? I said, yes, sir. He escorted me to his door, door to his office, and he said, now, I don't need to remind you of the seriousness of a security breach, do I? I said, no, sir. He said, all right, all right then you're dismissed. But as I left, so I was prepared to leave, he leaned over to speak into my ear to say something that the guys from in the suits couldn't see. He said, Lieutenant, if you were ever tortured in the future, if somebody has you up against the wall and they're frying your privates with fire, he said, you can tell them this just to get out of it. Just tell them what oh, was laser tracking. We didn't have laser tracking in 1964. For 17 years, I shut up. I never said anything to anybody. And then one night, I was doing a late night talk show in, in Eureka, California, on station KFMI. And the topic of UFOs came up, and I had, I had been muddling with this thing in my mind, because here's what happens, folks. You see something that you've, that, that, that's totally inexplicable. How in the heck could this thing, and it was, by the way, a flying saucer. It was shaped like a saucer, like a ping pong ball on top, and it was firing a beam of light at our warheads. How could such a thing happen? How could a guy from Compton, California, who'd gone to USC and played a little football and, and worked for Walt Disney and so on, suddenly have his world shaken up by discovering that we are not alone, that that thing was up there, 
that I saw it. It was on film. And, and by the way, I'm still alive, barely. When it happened to me, my world changed, my worldview changed, but I was under orders to shut up, so I shut up. Part of UFO, uh, U.S. Air Force cover-up, in fact. Finally, <clears throat> I told my story on my late-night radio show one night, and all kinds of <clears throat> strange things happened. I started getting calls from people I didn't know, uh, saying, that, oh, I had a UFO experience, too, and so on and so forth. Let's cut ahead a little ways to, I got a job teaching college at the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh. And I'm sure you, you, you folks in the press must know that we who teach college don't make a lot of money. And I was on a, a nine month contract. So in the summer, I decided I needed to make a couple of bucks to pay my rent and so forth. And so I thought, what can I do? And I thought, that UFO incident, I'll bet I could sell this to somebody because UFOs were, were a topic of, of concern at the moment. So I wrote an article about my experience and I shopped it around. It went to Omni Magazine, it went to Time, I shopped it around and no, no one was interested. So where would you go to sell a UFO story? I called the National Enquirer. And yes, they bought the story. And of course, they took my story and put it in the, their, their ridiculous writing style. His law, jaw dropped, he fell over, oh, good grief. One of those things that, that those of us who I used to teach journalism would go, oh my gosh, but I got paid. And then to put it mildly, the fit hit, just, hit the jam. Suddenly my world did change. I started getting telephone calls late at night at my home. I'm not gonna say the words because I don't wanna be censored here, but a voice would say, uh, it always ended up with, you're going down MF. You can interpret what MF means. They would leave this message on my, remember answering machines? We used to have those. Well, they would leave the message on my answering machine. They were, they were, they were, they were not, they were, they were fearless. One night, my wife and I came home from a movie and the phone rang and I picked it up and the voice said, fireworks in your mailbox at night. Oh, what a beautiful sight. You're going down, MF. And there was a boom. My wife and I went, to the, to the door, we lived in, in the country and we had a rural, mail, rural, rural mailbox. It was on fire. They had blown up my mailbox while I was talking to them on the phone. You're going down, MF. I put up with that for a couple of weeks and then I, I had a friend named John uh, uh, Andrews who worked for the Chester Corporation. He was a UFO researcher. And he said, what you have to do right now, Bob, is go public more and more. So he set me up to write an article for the MUFON Journal, the Mutual UFO Network Journal. And I did this in, in uh, journalistic prose and the, the immediate threats to me stopped. Um, having been part of a cover-up for so long and then having been threatened, I literally had my, my life threatened, I later lost a job at teaching college because a guy named Phil Class, who was a paid informant of the CIA, we're told, uh, wrote a letter to, to my supervisor there at the University of Maine saying uh, that I was making up tall tales of the journalism professor and how could, how could a university allow me to continue doing that and blah, blah, blah. And I was fired. This cover-up has been going on for a long, long time. And those of us who are here today in front of me, Bob Salas, who was a, a captain in the Air Force, who was actually one of those heroes who sat down in a, in a silo um, with, a, with a key and a, and a partner ready to go into Armageddon if he was ordered to do so. You can't imagine the pressure this man's been under. And what we're here today to tell you is that this is real, that you folks in the press need to get to it, and tell the story and tell it correctly and never mind spin never mind politics this has nothing whatever to do with politics doesn't matter who's president or who's chief executive of any corporation this is a real event it is the most important event in the history of mankind we are not alone 